Hi, I'm Daniel Chan from UNSW Sydney. Welcome to another adventure in pure mathematics. In a previous video, I talked about the norm function, which is very, very important in number theory. And we saw how it could be useful in a variety of areas, including looking at sums of two squares. In this video, I want to talk about an exciting non-commutative generalization of this, which is a much less well-known story. So to begin with, we're going to talk about the non-commutative analog of a uh, quadratic field extension. And the place we start with is actually with a field, K. So it's going to be just a commutative thing here. And because we're looking in the quadratic sort of case, we want to make sure that the characteristic of K does not equal 2 here. Okay, so when you do quadratic field extensions, uh, when you're not in characteristic 2, you add square roots of a single element. Okay, so here now, instead of a single element, uh, which will be non-zero, we're going to ask to have two elements A and B, which are inside K cross. K cross here, just to remind you all, uh, what's this notation mean? It's just a multiplicative group of non-zero elements. So you look at K minus zero, of course, you can multiply two such elements together and inverses exist here. So what we can do now with this information of this uh, field and these two elements is to find something called the quaternion algebra, which is going to be our non-commutative analog of this quadratic field extension. OK, so this algebra is going to be a K algebra. So in other words, a ring uh, where K sits inside the center. And the notation for it will be a comma b with a subscript k. And it's going to be defined very easily as follows. OK, so what we're going to do is we're going to look at the non-commutative polynomial ring in two variables x and y. And what we'll do is we factor out by various relations. OK, so the first relation is that x squared minus a equals 0. So x squared equals a. OK, so the a was given here y squared is going to be b. So y squared minus b is in the ideal that we quotient out by. And finally, uh, we want to introduce non-commutativity. And the non-commutativity is given by the following uh, relation. So yx plus xy is equal to 0. Okay. So in other words, what you'll find here is that inside this quotient, um, so inside here, if we're going to let x and y also denote their images inside this quotient, what you'll find is that yx is equal to negative xy. Okay, so x and y don't commute. Okay, so remember here the, the field uh, has characteristic not equal to 2, so yx equals minus xy means that yx and xy are definitely different. And uh, instead of saying they commute, uh, they fail to commute in a very precise way, and we say they skew commute instead. OK, so that's going to be our algebra, okay? our quaternion algebra, which is given by the input data of all the field and also these two elements A and B. OK, so let's uh, just have a little play around inside this algebra just to see how the uh, algebraic manipulations work. OK, so let's, for example, uh, look at what's x minus y times x plus y. OK, so now it's an algebra, it's a ring, so you can use the distributive law and expand to get, well, the x times x is x squared. You get a minus y plus times x, so that's minus yx. You get a plus xy plus xy, and you'll also get a minus y squared and minus y squared. And of course, now you can use the relations here to simplify, OK? So here, x squared minus a equals 0 tells the, that x squared equals a, so there's an a here. Uh, similarly, the y squared term here is uh, gives you a minus b. And what about the xy and the minus yx? Well, minus yx, remember, you have the skew commutativity. So since you have skew commutativity, uh, this minus yx is plus xy, so you get a plus 2xy. Okay, so there's an example of how you can manipulate um, algebraically inside this quaternion algebra. And the, one of the reasons why I wanted to show you this is it tells you straight away what a k basis for this is. So remember, this is a vector space over k. This uh, quaternion algebra A is in particular a vector space over k. And you can ask what's a natural basis for it. Well, um, inside the non-commutative polynomial ring, 
which is this here, okay, what you get as a basis is all the monomials in x and y. Okay, so that's the natural thing to uh, a starting point for a k basis of this a. So certainly one is going to be there. You can have x, you can have y. Okay, but the thing is, since x squared equals a, you don't have high powers of x and you don't have high powers of y. But you can multiply x and y together. Okay, so normally in non commutative algebra, it depends on the order x and y. Now in this case, y, x, uh, is equal to negative xy, so you don't have to also write in yx, okay? And if you think about it, of course, uh, since uh, you can always skew commute the x and the y, and the highest power of x and y that you need to use is only uh, 1, that means that this is actually a spanning set, y, 1, x, y, and x, y, and in fact, um, this is a k basis, and that implies that the dimension, the k dimension of this vector space, a, is equal to 4. Okay, so that's the quaternion algebra. So the first example of a quaternion algebra is actually very, very famous, and it's due to Hamilton uh, in the mid-1800s. And uh, it's the following one. It's a very special one where we work over the reals. And the A and B are both minus 1. Okay, so what I'll do is I'm going to write it out in the more usual notation. Instead of using x and y, he used i and j. And I'll write these, rather than writing an idea, I'll just write down the relations. So the relations are, firstly, the i and j are square roots of minus 1. So minus 1 equals i squared equals j squared. And then the other thing that you have is the skew commutativity relationship. Okay. And that is the following. Uh, j uh, minus j i equals i j, and this he wrote as k. Now, you should have seen this i, j, and k before, especially if you've done physics, okay? So often we use these as your standard basis vectors in three-dimensional Euclidean space, okay? And uh, in fact, the reason why Hamilton was interested in uh, this algebra here is the following. So one of the things that we know is if you look at complex numbers, which you can represent in the plane, multiplication by e to the i theta corresponds to rotation. So what he wanted to do was to have a look at uh, rotations, not in the plane, but in three-dimensional space. So initially he sought for a three-dimensional algebra uh, to try to uh, come up with something like that. Well, eventually he uh, came up with two key observations which allowed him to proceed and uh, achieve his goal of looking at three-dimensional rotations uh, akin to a multiplication by e to the i theta. So the first, and this is the key observation actually, and the trickiest one is that you can't just work in three dimensions, you have to go to four dimensions. And the other thing of course is that you have this skew commutativity that's involved. Okay, so this is a very, very interesting algebra, and in this case you can say a little bit more about um, the multiplication, which is extremely interesting, and I wanted to tell you about that. Okay, so let's suppose now you have um, elements V and W. They're elements of, well, we're going to assume that the constant term is... Um, equal to 0. So remember, a basis is 1, x, y, x, y. So in this case, the basis is i, j, k, and 1. And let's suppose you've just got the bit which is a linear combination of i, j, and k. Okay. So that's what you have here. Okay. So there are elements inside this um, uh, quaternion algebra, the Hamiltonians. And you can ask, what's v times w? Okay, so remember, you know how to multiply by a scalar anyway, so once I've told you what V times W is here, I've basically told you the whole multiplication. Okay, so uh, by the way, this part here of this quaternion algebra is called the imaginary part of the Hamiltonians, okay, except for now you've got three imaginary uh, parameters, so to speak, okay, the coefficients of i, j, and k. Okay, so we can break it up into the two parts. So the first part is, well, there's the part which is a scalar. Okay, what's the coefficient of 1? And interestingly enough, this is just the negative of the dot product of V and W. Okay, and then you can ask, well, what's the part which involves the i, j, and k? Well, interestingly, this is just the cross product 
of V and W. Okay, so let me just give you some motivation for what's going on. For example, if V and W is equal to I, okay, or, or, or J or K, so any of these standard basis vectors, well, what's I times I? What's I squared? That's minus 1. So that's the negative of the um, square of the length. Okay, so, and you can check that K squared is also equal to minus 1. Okay, so what about uh, the cross product? How does that occur? So you can see here, uh, I, I've defined ij equals to k, so i cross j equals k. And you can also, using these relations, show things like, for example, j cross k is equal to i, um, j times k is equal to i inside this Hamiltonians here. Okay, so this is the quaternions, and this tells you uh, the non-commutative generalization of a quadratic field extension. Okay, so let's move on. So the other thing that we introduce with quadratic field extensions is the Galois involution and also the norm. And we have that in this quaternion case as well. And it's quite interesting how that works. Okay, so I'll use the same notation as before. So we have this quaternion algebra A over this field K and it's given by A, B, these non-zero elements of K. And we're going to have an involution, so an order 2 map from A to A. And it's going to be defined as follows. I hope you can guess. So you have a quaternion. Remember, there's a basis which is 1x, so alpha 1x plus alpha 2y plus alpha 3xy. We're going to make it, uh, um, we're going to send this uh, element here to something which is like its uh, conjugate. So what we do here is this is just alpha 0 minus alpha 1x minus alpha 2y minus alpha 3xy. Okay, so at the moment it may seem a little bit of a strange thing, um, but when you see its nice properties, you will see why it's uh, uh, a natural thing to do. Okay, so the first point, okay, is just like the... Galois involution, okay, so the Galois involution, we saw that this is actually a ring isomorphism, okay, so this is going to be very similar, this involution here, firstly, it's k-linear, and is it multiplicative? Well, it is almost multiplicative, uh, and the correct way to say is it's actually anti-multiplicative, so sigma of w times z, it's the product of sigma of z and sigma of w, but since you have non-commutativity, you have to have the correct order, and the correct order is that you swap them around. So the sigma, the z here, which is second here, has to come first now. Okay. So sometimes we say this is a, a anti-isomorphism. It's an algebra anti-isomorphism. Okay. So now we can talk about the norm of one of these elements in the quaternion algebra W. Okay. So W is written as we have above here. Okay. And what's the norm? So we'll use the same recipe as before. It's just going to be you multiply W with sigma of W. And then you can just work uh, that out. Okay, so here you're going to multiply this quantity with its conjugate, so to speak, over here. So there are four terms times four terms. You get 16 terms. Okay. So what's rather interesting is um, most of the terms are going to cancel out because of skew commutativity. Okay, if you multiply an x term here by the y term over here, okay, that's going to cancel out with the product of the y term here with the x term here. So you only get the terms where you multiply like terms. Okay, so you get alpha. So in particular, you'll get this alpha zero times alpha zero. You get the alpha 1x times negative alpha 1x, alpha 2y times negative alpha 2y, and alpha 3xy times negative alpha 3xy. So you only get four terms left. And what are those four terms? So you get alpha 0 squared, plus, or, or rather minus, it's going to be, because there's a minus here, minus alpha 1 squared, and then x squared is what? x squared is equal to a. And then you get a negative minus alpha 2 squared y squared, and y squared is b, and then you have the square of xy, and since to square xy you have to shift the y and x past each other, so you'll get an extra minus, so you get a plus, and then you have x squared y squared, which is a, b, 
and there's an alpha 3 squared. And what's really nice about this is if you notice, okay, so that these alphas, they're all coefficients, okay, so they're inside our field K, and the A, B are also inside our field K. So this norm, what it does, it sends you from this A back to K. So let me just write that down specifically. This norm map A, you input something in A, and um, when you write it like this, it looks like it just lands inside A, but actually it would always land inside K, okay. And so the nice thing about this norm map, and this is something that we saw also in the norm map for quadratic field extensions, is that this norm map is multiplicative. Okay. So as for the proof of this, I don't want to uh, go through all the details. Uh, uh, a lot of it is just a long calculations, for example. You can just check both sides of this. Linearity is actually quite easy to see. And I've gone through most of the computation here for what the norm of W is. So uh, let me just show you what happens in part three, because that's quite interesting, okay? So you want to show the norm is multiplicative. So let's have a look at norm of W times Z. Okay, so what's that equal to? So it's WZ times sigma of WZ. And remember, sigma here is an anti-isomorphism. So this is not sigma of W times sigma of uh, Z, it's sigma of Z times sigma of w. Okay, and now what you have is, well, the z and the sigma of z, they're next to each other, so that's just the norm of z. So this is equal to w times the norm of z times sigma of w. And the point is that this is inside k, so this is inside the center of this algebra. Uh, you can shift that outside, so that's all, all to the end, if you like. So you get w sigma of w, times norm of z, and now you've got the w times sigma of w is just norm of w, and that's multiplied by the norm of z. Okay, so here you find that indeed uh, you have that this norm of w, norm of w z is equal to norm of w times norm of z, okay, and it critically uses the fact that this sigma is an anti isomorphism, so you can switch the order. And that's absolutely key. So it turns out that this is true for good reasons. Okay. So this proposition gives us three very nice uh, properties. Okay. And uh, just to sum up, okay, this involution sigma is an anti-isomorphism, and the norm is multiplicative, and the norm is a map which sends you from A back down to the uh, field K that you started off with. Okay, so there's some really interesting corollaries about this. Okay, since the norm is multiplicative, what can it say? It means that it has to send units to units. Okay, the unit equation, okay, which is just uh, basically if z is invertible, right? So z is invertible is uh, z times z inverse equals 1. Okay, so there exists some z inverse there. And you can apply the norm to this. Okay, and that will tell you that the norm of z, uh, if z is invertible, if z is invertible, then the norm of z has to be a unit, and since the norm of z is inside the field k, that just means it's non-zero. Okay, and similarly, well, if the norm of w is non-zero, okay, and that means that this product w times sigma of w is non-zero, then it's quite easy to find the uh, inverse of this w. It's basically just some um, scalar multiple of sigma of w. Okay, You just have to, to divide by this non-zero uh, scalar inside k. Okay, So that's something that we saw also happened in the case of norms for quadratic field extensions. Okay, So that was uh, rather uh, nice. Okay, and so what we see here is the following. Okay, so if z is invertible, okay, suppose every non zero element is invertible, okay, that means that you've got essentially a non commutative field or what's called a division ring. Okay, so a division ring just means that every non zero element is invertible, so you can divide by non zero elements. And this now gives you a reinterpretation of that. That means that this norm map over here, okay, what can you say about this norm map? Uh, this norm map has no non-trivial zeros. Okay. 
So, um, because if it does, so certainly norm of zero is equal to uh, norm of zero. If you put zero inside here for W, then you'll get zero over here. Okay. So you certainly can never divide by zero anyway. But you want to say that uh, to be a division ring, uh, that means that all the other elements are invertible. In other words, all the other elements have norm which is not zero. Okay, so do we have actually any examples where this occurs? And I claim that Hamilton's uh, example is precisely one such example. Okay, so let's just see what happens there. Okay, so when you have that example here, let's look at this uh, norm. Okay, what is this norm? So remember the norm that's given here, essentially by this. You can think of this as a quadratic form in the variables, this alpha 0, alpha 1, alpha 2, and alpha 3, okay? In this case, um, A, B are both minus 1, so uh, when you look at what this expression is here, okay, what is this expression here? What does that boil down to in this uh, particular case? Uh, let me just write it up to the top here, so in the case uh, minus 1, minus 1, R, the quadratic uh, form that you get is you get alpha 0 squared plus alpha a is minus 1 alpha 1 squared and then b is minus 1 so you get plus alpha 2 squared and you have plus min a and b are both minus 1 so you get a plus alpha 3 squared so here the norm is actually quite nice it's just the sum of four squares and those four squares are the squares of the coefficients with respect to this this rather standard basis that you have Okay, and of course we know that um, since we're talking about squares of reals here, this is always positive unless all those entries are zero. Okay, so this shows you a rather interesting link, okay, between, well, something being a d division algebra and the fact that um, here the only zero that you have for this quadratic form is in fact when all the uh, variables are zero. Okay, so let's have a look at a very, very important concept when we study these quaternion algebras, okay? And one thing that we saw is that one example of a quaternion algebra with Hamiltonians is a division ring. Let's have a look at uh, the, a rather different case of what happens, and that's called here the split case, okay? The split case here. And that's going to occur where when the two uh, scalars that you use to define this quaternion algebra, one of them is a square, so I'll write it as a squared. Okay, so remember, what you'll have inside this algebra is you'll certainly have k, and you'll also have uh, x. And remember, the square of x is going to be equal to this first term here, so you have x squared minus a squared. Okay, so in particular, it contains this ring here. And so this is a quotient of a polynomial ring. And what happens is, well, in this case here, this x squared minus a squared, that factors, okay? So this is by the Chinese remainder theorem, isomorphic to kx over the ideal generated by x minus a cross kx over the ideal generated by x plus a. And that's because we're not working in characteristic two. So x minus a and x plus a are quite different. Okay, so of course that's just isomorphic to k cross k as uh, an algebra. Okay, so the important thing here is that this quaternion algebra over here, it contains k cross k, and that means that it contains zero divisors. Okay, it contains things which are not units, so this implies it's not a division ring. In fact, we can say more about it. We can say precisely what it is. In this case here, when uh, one of these entries is a square, you get a, a very familiar algebra. It's just two by two matrices in K. In fact, I can say what the uh, isomorphism is, okay? So remember uh, this quaternion algebra here, it's uh, 
quotient of the non-commutative polynomial ring given by x and y. So if I tell you where x and y correspond to on the uh, 2 by 2 matrix side, that will give you the isomorphism. Okay. So x is going to be, so the isomorphism is going to be given by the following. Okay. So remember, x has to be a square root of a squared. So the square root I'm going to pick is the diagonal matrix a minus a. And it's quite easy to see that when you square that, you do indeed get um, the, the scalar matrix, uh, which is a squared times the identity. What does y map to? And here we need a square root of b. Well, fortunately, it's easy to square root that in two by two matrices. Okay, there are lots and lots of square roots, in fact, but we're going to pick this one. Okay, 0, 1, b, 0. Okay, and I claim that this is going to be a legitimate uh, isomorphism. Okay, so how do you show that it's a legitimate isomorphism? So I guess you need to show the correct relations hold. So as we've noticed before, x squared equals a squared times the identity. So I'll just write it like that. Um, let's look at y squared. y squared equals 0, 1, b, 0 times 0, 1, b, 0. And what's that equal to? So I guess um, if you look at uh, the di this top left entry here, you've got 0, 1 zipped up with this uh, 0, b. So you'll get a b here. Um, if you look at uh, this 1, 2 entry over here, You've got this um, same, oh, sorry about that. Uh, you've got the same 0, 1, but now with a 1, 0. And since they're in different positions, you get a 0. And similarly, when you work out the other two entries, you get 0, B. So this is B. And finally, you can check that Y, X equals negative X, Y. So that tells you that there's a natural, uh, this, the, these two assignments give you a natural homomorphism from um, a squared b k to m 2 k. And it's clearly surjective because you're mapping onto the generators x and uh, oh. So let me um, go back. Uh, I guess you need to check that x and y generate this algebra over here, like okay, x and y generate to the left hand side. And if you can show that it generates the right hand side, you have surjectivity. And then I guess once you have that, you just have to check uh, uh, that uh, the kernel is zero, but you know the dimension of both sides, they're four, both four dimensional. Okay, so since they're both four dimensional and you have surjectivity, then you know that it's actually going to this ring isom this ring homomorphism is going to be a, an algebra isomorphism. Okay. So that's rather nice. So um, a lot of the time, okay, if one of these are squares, then in fact you just get two by two matrices. Okay, so remember in the case of Hamiltonians, minus one, minus one, ah, okay, the minus ones, neither of them are squares. Okay, so you can't apply this fact. And the other way to see that, of course, is that this, uh, in case of the Hamiltonians, you actually get a division ring. Okay, so the next theorem is extremely interesting. Okay, the next theorem basically tells you that these are the only two things that can happen. Okay, if you look at this um, this quaternion algebra, then either it's a division ring, or it is isomorphic to two by two matrices in K. And in this second case, we we're going to call it split. Okay, so there's this really interesting dichotomy that occurs with these quaternion algebras. And it's rather interesting that um, one of the things that uh, this picks up is that, well, when this a, when one of the terms here is going to be a square inside the field, okay, so a squared here means that it's a square of something inside the field, okay, then uh, you're going to be in the split case, okay? So this is telling you something about number theory, okay? When is something a square inside the field? That's number theoretic information. Okay, so let's move on to the relationship with number theory, okay? So this is really, really interesting, okay? And that's what I really want to tell you about, okay? Which shows you how, rather strangely, non-commutative algebra really tells you something about number theory, okay? So this theorem tells you that the following three conditions are equivalent. Okay, so firstly, we're going to look at this quaternion algebra, we'll call it A. And the first one is that it's split. Okay, split means it's not a division 
ring, okay, by the previous theorem, okay, it means it's isomorphic to two by two matrices in K, and by the previous theorem, that means that it's not a division ring. And we also saw that you can see when something is a division ring by looking at the norm form here. Okay, so this is also equivalent to the fact that this quadratic form, norm from A to K, has a non-trivial zero. Okay, that quadratic form has a non-trivial zero. And the other thing that you might ask is that, well, um, before, when was an example that we saw that something was split? The example where we saw something split was when this term here was a square. And you can say, is that the only time that it's split? Well, it turns out that no, that's not the only time that it's split, but actually the answer is much more interesting, okay? It's going to pick up more subtle information, okay? So, of course, for it to split, it also depends on the other quantity here, okay? So, what's that? So, what we're going to do is we're going to look at this extension, um, k adjoin root a over k. Now, there are only two uh, possibilities for what this extension can be. Either a is already a square, in which case, so note that a a square, square implies k adjoint root a is just equal to k. If it's not a square, well then you have a quadratic field extension. And we can talk about norms just as we did in the rational case. And if it's not clear how to define that in this more general setting, I'll show you when we go through the explanation of what's going on. Okay, for what that is. Okay, so um, we're going to look at the, uh, the norm for either a quadratic field extension when a is not a square. When a is a square, then you just get the extension k over k. And the norm here is going to be a map from k to k, okay, which is just the identity. So everything's a norm. Okay, so in this case, um, that's telling you that if a is a square, okay, then everything is a norm, and particularly b is a norm, and so you're in the split case. Okay, so let's uh, let's try to. Uh, I've sort of described the link between one and two, so I want to describe the link between three and the others. Okay, so how does that work? And it works quite simply as follows, okay? What we're going to do is we're going to change variables, okay? So the x we're going to keep the same, but we'll call it x bar. But instead of using y, I'm going to change it by something that's non-zero in the field extension, essentially k root a. So remember, x is equal to root a. You can think of this as root a, okay? So at least um, that makes complete sense when you're uh, looking in the case a is not a square, which perhaps we should assume here. Okay. So what I'm going to do is this y bar is going to be alpha 0 plus alpha 1x. Okay, so maybe I'll just write here assume, assume a uh, not a square. And one way to write this is it's not inside k cross square. Okay. So now I claim um, the x bar and the y bar, okay, they also satisfy relations which look just like the relations for the quaternion algebra, okay. So again, x is equal to um, uh, x bar, so x bar squared is equal to a, okay. And one of the things is that since uh, this x bar, which is x, commutes with this expression here, which is just a linear function in x, okay, and it skew commutes with y, we still have uh, y bar x bar equals negative x bar y bar. And then the interesting question here is, well, what's y bar squared? Okay, so it's, at the moment, the x bar and y bar just look like the generators for some quaternion algebra, okay? And the only key question is, what's, what's y bar squared? So let's have a look at this and work that out. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're just going to write down um, y bar squared. So there's a y bar is alpha 0 plus alpha 1 x y. And we multiply it by itself, alpha 0 plus alpha 1 x y. Okay, so of course what we want to do is we want to swap this y with this alpha 0 plus alpha 1 x. Okay, so let's see how that works. So this is the following. So you have this alpha 0 plus alpha 1 x. And then this bit here we want to work on. So that y times alpha 0, we, this is just a, a scalar, so you can write this alpha 0 y. The y times the x, well, we've got to use the skew commutativity to push that pass through. So this is plus 
alpha minus alpha one x y rather, and then you have the y over here. Now the y's on the right hand side, we can pull that out, and then what we'll have here is the alpha zero plus alpha one x. You pull the y out, so you get a y squared, and what you have here, you have alpha zero minus alpha one x. Okay. So this is really, really interesting what's going on. Why is that? So what you have, so you've got the, the y squared here. So that's going to be your b. But the expression here is alpha 0 plus alpha 1 x plus its conjugate. So it's a image under the Galois involution. Okay, So you're thinking of x as square root of a. And remember, the Galois involution sends the square root of a to minus the square root of a. So this is this product, which is just a norm. So at the end of the day, let me sum up on the next page. So therefore, y bar squared equals the norm of this alpha 0 plus alpha 1 x. And I'll write the alpha 1 x as this uh, alpha 1 square root a times y squared, which is b. Now, of course, we just change generators. Okay, so what this is telling us is the following. So let's call this element equal to alpha. So that implies that this quaternion algebra a, b, k is isomorphic to by changing variables. So the x bar still squares to a, but the y bar now squares not to b, but to the norm of alpha times b. So the key point here is that if we change b by the norm of alpha inverse, okay, we get an isomorphic algebra, but now this has become 1, and 1 is a square, so it's split. And it turns out that this is the only thing that can happen to make it split, okay? So that's the condition, okay? So this implies, uh, so therefore, um, b... Um, equals norm alpha inverse implies uh, a, b, k split. Okay, and that shows you a really interesting link between norms and non-commutative algebra. Okay, so just to emphasize the import of this, okay, one thing that we're interested in is, remember, this norm map, and in particular, what's the image of the norm map? So what things are norms? Okay, and we're also interested in the kernel of the norm map, but that's not going to show up in this particular theorem. And one of the things is that uh, this uh, this theorem in, um, tells you something about this in a very interesting way. B is a norm from this quadratic field extension if what you do is you look at this non-commutative algebra here. You look at that non-commutative algebra and you ask whether it's split. Okay, and that will tell you the answer to that question. So it gives you another way of looking at it. Okay, so let me just sum up with some concluding remarks, which is really interesting because it tells you that there's this relationship between number theory, okay, where you're interested in things like trying to solve polynomial equations over a field, okay, and um, non-commutative algebra. Okay, so the first thing is that... Um, the point is that in arithmetic, we don't look at algebraically closed fields. Okay, so if you want to solve polynomial equations, okay, it can be hard. And when I mean that, I don't mean hard as in, well, we don't have many techniques for actually finding the solutions. I mean, there are some obstructions, real obstructions to the existence of solutions. Okay, so what we're interested in is given a field which is not algebraically closed, okay, how hard is it to solve is it? to solve equations in K, okay? How hard meaning, you know, um, are there lots of obstructions to the existence of solutions? And that's the arithmetic complexity of a field in some ways, okay? And the point here is that it manifests itself in a rather nice way. It manifests itself in various division rings here, okay? That's one of the incarnations that you see that oh, if something is, a field is such that it's hard to solve these equations, there are these obstructions, then you get these division rings, okay? 
So for example, you can't have the sum of four squares equal to a negative number, and that's essentially the reason why Hamiltonians uh, form a division ring. Okay, so that's a rather interesting remark, okay, and the main thing that I wanted to get across in this video. The second remark that I want to talk about is that, well, when we looked at norms for quadratic field extensions, it told us something about sums of two squares. When we look at Hamiltonians, I showed you that the norm here corresponds to sums of four squares. So you might be interested in looking at integral Hamiltonians. And in fact, there is quite a theory about integral Hamiltonians here, which is like Gaussian integers. Um, it's a little bit more subtle because unlike uh, the case of Gaussian integers where the real and imaginary part are integers, you have to throw in a few more um, Hamiltonians, okay? There's also, if you look at 1 plus i plus j plus ij, a half of that also turns out to be an integer in this sort of case. And you can ask, well, does that tell you about sums of four integer squares? And the answer is yes. You can actually use these integral Hamiltonians to prove Lagrange's four squares theorem, which says what? It says that every non-negative integer can be written as the sum of four squares. Okay, so this is a rather interesting fact, and it's rather, um, it's even more interesting that you can prove this using non-commutative algebra. And so finally, I want to say that actually the relationship between these non-commutative quaternion algebras, A, B, K, and this idea of solving equations, okay, runs much deeper. There's something, I don't want to go through all the details of what's going on here, but there's something called Witt's theorem, okay? So suppose you have this here, this ABK, what you can also do is you can look at this homogeneous equation AU squared plus v, BV squared equals W squared, okay? So this is a homogeneous equation in the variables U, V and W, okay? And it uh, depends on the A and B, which are here. And this defines a conic inside the U, V, W projective plane, okay? So it's some sort of projective scheme. And um, it's a scheme over K. I don't want to get into the definition of what a scheme is here. It's rather subtle, okay? So what happens here is that isomorphism classes of these algebras here, isomorphism classes of this here, correspond to isomorphism classes of this projective scheme or this projective conic, okay? So this projective conic is rather curious, okay? So which what corresponds to the split case? In the split case, this conic has a rational point, so it's isomorphic to the projective line, okay? But once it doesn't have a rational point, okay, it's a very interesting scheme over K, okay? And there are various possibilities for what it is, okay? So um, to sum up, uh, what I want to show you in this playlist is this rather interesting interplay between non-commutative algebra and number theory. I hope you enjoyed this adventure in pure mathematics.